Because see, I'm sure somebody came here and they said, man, I, I, I just can't wait to hear him dog Donald Trump. Ooh, I can't wait to hear him lay into this person. Or maybe he'll tell us what was it like when he put Wendy Williams on blast. And maybe some other people expected to come here and say, oh, I would love to know what was it like when he interviewed Michelle Obama and President Barack Obama and ooh, what was it like uh, to go to the White House for the, for the parties and the receptions? Uh, what was it like to be at NBA All-Star Game last year? No, I'm not talking about any of that. I'm not because where I am is I'm not so focused on black history of the past. I'm concerned about what black history will we create in the future. And I'm concerned about what will be the very institutions that will give us entree to those places that will allow us to be able to show who we are, to be able to show what kind of talent we have. Because when I look at what's happening right now, when I look at HBCUs withering on the vine, when I look at FAMU graduates only giving 5%, 5 percent, 5 percent of graduates giving back to the university, when I look at the former president of Wilberforce who said when he arrived, only 1% of all graduates were given to the institutions and it was 9% last year. When the president of Howard says 3.7% of all undergrads were given to the institution and he has it up to 10%, somebody should be saying, what in the hell are we thinking? Because we're not talking about 3.7% or 5% of people giving a thousand. No, that's 5% of all Florida a and graduates giving a dime. So how can folks be proud to wear letters and proud to say, oh, I went to so-and-so if they're unwilling to create the same avenue for an unborn black child right now? How can we talk about what is happening with us economically and Madam C.J. Walker and talk about A.G. Gaston and talk about all these African Americans who own businesses and they had hotels and Black Wall Street, have all those conversations and then we're unwilling to even help to sustain black banks. See, I love it when in introductions, they talk about, I spent six years at CNN, and while there, best political team, and we won the Peabody Award, and we did all these things, but let me help you out. CNN did not pay me for my voice on television first. TV One did. And when I joined CNN, they wanted me to leave TV One. I said, no. In fact, in 2009, I had lunch with John Klein, who was then president of CNN US, and, and John said, when you going to give up TV One and Tom Joyner and all this stuff and focus on us full time? Not missing a beat, I said, when are you going to give me a five day a week show? then I might think about it. 2008 election, night Obama won. Roland, we want you on the set. I said, that's fine, but I gotta do two hits at TV One. Well, what do you mean? I said, well, what I mean is, I'm also on TV One. TV One also has election night coverage. I need to step away at least twice on election night from CNN to go do TV One. And that was just this befuddled look because they were thinking, we are so much bigger than that little network. And I had to remind them, but that little network paid me before you called me. 
What I'm trying to say is never in my life have I ever felt that mainstream media was bigger, badder, and better than black media. The, the, the reason I'm saying that is because the things that I have been able to accomplish in my career, I have been able to do that by working at black media institutions that have provided me the freedom to be able to do the kind of journalism that I want to do. See, at CNN, I, I would ask somebody, could I go cover this because it was somebody else's show? Well, for four years at Washington Watch, a Sunday show, for four years of News One Now, I didn't ask somebody, could I go? I was the one who decided where we went, so I asked myself. What, what I'm trying to get you to understand is that were it not for being able to have a platform that is black owned and black controlled, I was able to control the narrative of our people and put individuals on air who otherwise would never get called who are folks making history. How many of you have ever heard of Dr. Hadai Nicole Green? This is a sister who's a graduate of Tuskegee, a sister who is a physicist. That means she's really, really smart. She's now on the Morehouse School of Medicine staff. This sister has developed a unique experience, a unique treatment that reduces cancer, cancer tumors smaller than that of a pebble. Her research is amazing. She is now trying to raise $30 million to go to the experiment, experimental stage to all of where it can actually become an actual treatment. She launched this initiative on my show and, and I need y'all to explain, understand something. We are having a discussion about cancer cells. I didn't know what the hell she was talking about. I'm looking at her like this here. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Really? Mm-hmm. I don't know what she's talking about. But she's talking and she's smiling and, and she's explaining it. Do y'all realize that of all the things that I have talked about on my show, that is the most viewed interview of all my stuff on Facebook at 14, it's now at 14.1 million views. This was a conversation with a sister who was an HBCU graduate, who's now at an HBCU, talking about cancer. I'm saying that because who else would give her that shot to talk for 20 minutes on a national television show about cancer research? Folks were illuminated by the conversation and they said, man, I had never even heard of this sister. I'm saying that because this sister will be one of the folks who they will be hailing in 30 and 50 years as one of our greatest uh, black scientists. And imagine if she never had a place to tell her story and never had a place to be able to raise money. We have to be right now thinking about black history in terms of not black history that has happened, but black history that is about to happen and that will happen. And how will we be contributors to making that possible? And we can only make that possible by virtue of our dollars, by virtue of our resources, by virtue of our relationships, which means that every single person sitting in this room must take a personal interest in being someone who says, I might not have Oprah money. I might not have LeBron's fame. But I, too, 
can be a black history maker. I too can change and alter the course of our history by virtue of what I do today. Because see, I really need all of us to understand that what is happening in America right now is going to require a renewed purpose on behalf of black folks right now. We are moving towards a nation that by 2043, we will be a majority minority country. White Americans will make up 47% of all Americans. We are moving toward a place when Latinos will be the highest minority group in America, African Americans second, Asian Americans third, actually will be Latinos first, then whites, then blacks and Asians. And we already have people who got caught up in the Obama years of, oh, we in a post-racial America, and oh, can't we just all get along, and I'm going, y'all clueless, because that ain't the truth. You got white folks recruiting white supremacists on college campuses as we speak. We have a different world that is happening right in front of our very eyes. The question is, are we actually ready for that new world? See, for me, when I look at reading rates and math rates of African-American kids, I'm real concerned. Because, see, I'm concerned that by 2043, we will be like South Africa. Black folks in the majority, yet white folks holding all the economic power. I'm concerned that we will be in a situation where we will only be able to qualify for customer service or labor jobs and have numerical numbers, but still be broke as hell. I'm concerned that if we are not black-centric, unapologetically black, then we literally will be looking at a nation where we will have significant numbers, but we will have been so focused on making other people happy and letting them validate who we are that we will not be in control of our own story and we will be begging folks, can y'all please talk about us? Can you please do it? And I'm sorry, that's not an America I want to be in. Folks, what we're looking at is real. And it is happening before our very eyes. Let me put you this way. Other students in here. How many of you know somebody right now who's on the verge of flunking out and going home? No, no, no. See, yeah, some of y'all just like, oh my God, did he just ask that question? Oh my God. No, 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 no. I, I, I want you to be very, I want you, I, I'm, I'm going somewhere here. Raise your hand if you know of a classmate who's not doing well and who is on the verge of failing and they're going to have to go home. Raise your hand. Don't be scared. Some of y'all like, okay, he's going to get me in trouble. No. Now, if you sit next to that particular person, don't raise your right hand, raise your left hand. <laughs> now, now, the question now becomes, if you are aware that you have a classmate who is on the verge, for whatever reason, of flunking out, are you and your other peers helping to make sure that doesn't happen? See, a few of y'all shaking y'all heads. See, I'm going somewhere with this. You are completely unaware of what might happen with that person sitting next to you or living next to you in a dormitory. You're unaware of where they might be 20 years from now. The person next to you who is failing today could very well be a venture capitalist tomorrow. 
The person who is failing today could very well be a movie director tomorrow, could very well be a CEO, could very well be a university president. You have no idea what they might do because they need some help today and they could be the person that helps you tomorrow. The person next to you today who is failing could be a history maker tomorrow. And we have no idea. So what then happens if we stay silent and allow that brother or sister to fail? That means that the potential that they have will never ever be realized but had they gotten a helping hand by their fellow students, they would have been able to get over this short-term storm and would then be in a position to be great later. I want you to think about that. Because what I'm actually saying to you is, we can't talk about collective economics if we don't talk about collective education. We can't run around with our nice cute shirts, I am my brother's keeper, if I'm not keeping any brothers. We can't run around talking about our cute little at Abby's black girl magic if we ain't helping no black girls. What I'm trying to say is, if you are unwilling to help save one of your classmates, who will be there when you need to be saved one day? Now take that and advance it 10, 15 years. Who then will be there to help you when it comes to your business, when it comes to starting a new venture. You may very well look back one day at a classmate who you helped, then who will come to your aid later. I, I, I'm saying this because I, I really need us to now imagine what the black experience has been like for the last 399 years. Because when the first 20 odd Africans arrived in America in 1619, we went through 244 years of slavery. Emancipation Proclamation comes along, and then all of a sudden, we go through 12 years of reconstruction. And then after a great compromise of 1876, becomes election of 1876, the Great Compromise of 1877, we go through almost 100 years of Jim Crow. And the only reason we're even sitting in this room is because we had folks who look like us who said we ain't got nobody but us, so we've got to have each other's back. So when you read Barbara Ransby's book on Ella Baker, one of the greatest organizers we've never heard of. You will understand that her family in North Carolina, her dad, they grew all kinds of crops and there were so many black folks who were living around them who didn't have food and then what they did was they fed their own people. Mama on Sundays would fix dinner for the family and then get with a group of other black women and take extra food and go feed other families. That's our story. Monday, Stanley Nelson debuted his documentary on PBS on the history of HBCUs. In that documentary, they told the story, same thing, of cooperative economics, cooperative education, of African Americans helping one another, building one another, sustaining one another. The reason HBCUs are still standing today is because black folks said, we got to put this stuff together because ain't nobody else gonna save us but us. 
We talked about today, oh my goodness, Ryan Coogler, he directed Black Panther. And we talked about, oh my goodness, we have other directors, Antoine Fuqua, and we got Ava DuVernay, but then you also had Oscar Michaud. A brother who had his own movie studio in the 40s and 50s, and he was directing his own films. See, you can't talk about Gordon Parks unless you deal with Oscar Misha. You can't talk about Spike Lee unless you talk about Gordon Parks. You can't talk about Ryan Coogler unless you talk about Spike Lee, John Singleton, and others. And what you'll realize is all these brothers and sisters are also helping one another. Ryan Cooler said that he was editing Black Panther across the hallway from Ava, the, uh, editing A Wrinkle in Time. And those moments where he was tired and frustrated and, and was losing it, he would step into the hallway and Ava was sitting there encouraging him, brother, just stay with it, you can do it, and helping him out. And he said that's what helped him get him through. So when the movie makes $242 million, he said it ain't just about me. If it wasn't for Ava being there encouraging me as well, I could not have done it. So we can't look at black success and black history through this very narrow lens. We must understand that everything that we have gotten has not been because it's me, myself, and I. The reason I got here after five is because I was in Atlanta. I landed at 1030 and went straight to the home of Juanita Abernathy. Juanita Abernathy is the widow of Ralph David Abernathy, who was the right-hand man of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. But in talking to Juanita, he wasn't just the right-hand man. She said that Daddy King said they were so close that Martin Luther King had a, had a better, closer relationship with Ralph David Abernathy than he did with his own brother. She said other than one time, every time King was arrested, Ralph David Abernathy was in jail with him. Because, she said, when King would go to jail, Abernathy was there to look after him, and King was in jail to look after Abernathy. He said, other than one time. When King was killed, assassinated on April 4th, 1968, in Memphis, Lorraine Motel, he and Abernathy were in the same room. Abernathy was finishing shaving. King had finished shaving. He was on the balcony. If you go to the National Civil Rights Museum right now, they still have the rooms, and there are two double beds in the room that King last slept in. He slept in one, Abernathy in the other. Now, you would think if King was all that, he could have his own room. But they were that close. What I'm saying is, we can't even fool ourselves to celebrate Dr. King and act as if it was just him. Because without Abernathy, there is no king. In fact, she told us an amazing story. Y'all, this is pretty funny. I said, well, where did they first meet? She said, oh, that's really funny. She said, they were in college and Abernathy was going to take a woman to a party and she said, I can't go because I'm sick. So Abernathy went to the party anyway. She got to the party and the woman who said she was sick was at the party. Oh, it gets better. He walked up. She went to the party with Dr. King. Now, some of y'all look at me right now saying, if the woman I wanted to go to the party with lied and she wasn't sick and went to the party with some other dude, some of y'all dudes in here will be mad at the dude and not her. 
She said, Abinadi and King busted out laughing. Because not one of them really liked her. She was just a date. And these two ended up becoming lifelong friends. What I'm saying is, there was a bond there that existed and our lives are better for it because they had each other's back. We praise Harriet Tubman. But Harriet Tubman could not have been involved in the Underground Railroad if there were not other people who were there. And not all of them looked like us. There were folks who were white who were as just as passionate about freedom and slavery as Harriet Tubman. What I'm trying to paint here is that black history is not a singular thing. Black history is a collective thing. We have been able to survive and thrive as a result of us working together, partnering together, loving together, being mad with one another, getting over being mad with one another, but understanding that if we go through this earth and we think it's just about us, then we are going to fail in a massive way. I am trying to get you to understand that there is a brother or a sister who is sitting next to you, who is in need, who may not even have the courage to ask for help. And I'm saying you should be willing to say, brother or sister, how can I help you? What I'm saying is that even if you are out of, out of school and you might be a fraternity brother, you might say, well, I'm an alpha and he's a kappa. Yeah, you, you might be an alpha and he's a kappa. But let me remind you, MLK was an alpha. Abernathy was a capital. Abernathy couldn't get in. That ain't my fault. Or need Abernathy say it. King and Abernathy used to always joke back and forth over the whole thing. But my point is, they didn't let Greek drama keep them from working together. And so when we look at what's happening around here, you can't tell me somehow that Deltas and AKAs can't work together. You can't tell me that we from one part of a city, so from another part of a city, we can't work together. The only way we are going to be able to change our circumstance is when we come to grips with the fact that we are in this thing together no matter what. So what do we do? Do we go through life playing on our phones, playing games, living on social media? Do we go through this world hating on one another? Talking about gossip, spread nonsense? Or do we say we have this unique opportunity to change the course of our history for the future. Next year, we will commemorate the 400th anniversary of 20 odd Africans arriving in this country. 2043, that's 2019. 2043, we will become majority minority country. So my question is, when 2019 hits, what will we be focused on for the next 24 years? So when the next generation arrives on this scene, what will we have left for them to finish that we started? See, I know there's a freshman here looking at me going, man, I'm not thinking about 2043. I'm just trying to get through 2018. And I know that's somebody who's a sophomore, junior, senior, you have maybe a, lump, a graduate, you may look at me like, I'm not, bro, I, I can't be focused on that. Here's why I think you're wrong. Because that was somebody who actually thought 
about you being in this place one day. If you really look at our history, slaves knew I might die a slave, but that does not mean I'm not going to keep fighting for freedom. There were people who said, I will never see the fruits of my labor after the Emancipation Proclamation, but my children will be free. There, are, there were black folks. How many of y'all got people in your family? You got grandmothers and grandfathers that had like 15, 18 kids. And you, and you would go, all 15, 18 of y'all went to college, but y'all only made like five or six thousand dollars because they said, no matter how, you gonna go to college and you will graduate. Imagine what it must have been like to have a third grade education but you laid down the law and saw 15 kids walk across a college stage with a degree. See, I, I'm not talking about big names. I'm not talking about celebrities. I'm talking about regular, ordinary black folks who you don't even know who said, my child will get an education. That's also black history. But what I'm saying is, they made it clear, you are going to do this because you are going to do this for your grandchildren one day and your children's children. So what I'm trying to lay out here is the decisions that we make today are going to actually impact our children's children's children. That means that we have the potential today to break generational curses. We have the, tip, the potential today to create new legacies. We have the potential today to build upon a greater and grander lineage by virtue of the actions that we take today. So I want you to understand that just because something is happening today that you might think is not that really, that's not that big of a deal. What I'm trying to tell you is, it is because what you decide to do today could alter the course of history for your family. And you just think that's just a small little thing. I don't have children, but my nieces and nephews have been able to benefit from the life and the career that I have created. Mom and daddy never went to college, but daddy watched news five hours a day, read two newspapers, made us go to the library every week and not check out the minimum number of books, but check out the maximum number of books. And then had to read those in a week and come back the next week and check out the maximum number of books. So when I'm sitting on TV and the stage guy goes, how do you know all of this stuff? I go, you got to tell as mom and daddy because they made a brother read. And there's somebody sitting here right now. You have parents who have made you do certain things and you are mad and upset. Like, I don't know why they making me do this because they see something that you don't see. And again, I know, I know somebody is like, yeah, okay, I mean, I hear you, that sounds great. No. Y'all understand, I went to a magnet school of communications. We had magnet schools in Houston, and I, it was between a high school for law enforcement and criminal justice, a school of communications, and I chose school of communications, Jack Gates High School. And so I love sports. And I was, I said, I'm going to do sports journalism. My dad said, no, you're not. I'm looking at him like, why? You ain't even go to college. What you talking about? This is what my daddy said. Y'all, I'm telling you. This is 1983. My daddy said, son, I do not want you 
to do all that work, to go to, co go to college, become excellent at sports journalism, and then you get replaced by a retired athlete. Now, mind you, in 1983, you didn't have a lot of retired athletes who were doing sports news. So I'm looking at my, like, my dad, like, what the hell are you talking about? But considering he was the one who picked me up and dropped me off, I'm like, I might want to listen to what he just had to say. So I had to change. Three years later, I'm a junior. And all of a sudden, Dan Patrick, who was then the main sports anchor at the CBS affiliate in Houston, Dan Patrick leaves. They hire the starting quarterback of the Houston Oilers, Gifford Nielsen, to replace him. Nielsen retires with the Oilers to become a sports anchor. Matt Musel, who was the weekend guy who was sure he was going to get the main job, was so mad he left the station. Now I'm reading this story going, damn, he got replaced by a football guy. And look at my daddy like, the hell did you know that was gonna happen? And I'm like, that was a pretty smart decision dad told me to do. My dad wasn't in media, but God clearly put something in his head to tell me what not to do. That doesn't mean that I could not have gone into sports, but had I ignored what daddy said, what would my life have been like? I don't mind seeing people, y'all turn the lights back on. <laughs> what would my life have been like? What I'm trying to get you to understand is that God has a way of sending people to us to inform us of certain things and make us aware of certain things that we don't even know what's in the future. And if we are disobedient, our life might go this way as opposed to go this way. I'm gonna get this last one before I close because I'm, I, I, I need to make it as clear as possible why what you do today could change tomorrow and then change the circumstances for your children's children. I was in the 11th grade. We had career day. We didn't know we had career day. All of a sudden, two folks just walked into our government class and they said, it's career day. We're like, okay. It's about 30 black students in this government class. And so they introduced themselves, and one of them was an Asian woman, and she was a municipal judge in Houston. Another of them was this white guy who had an import and export business, and he happened to be the former chairman of the Texas Republican Party. And so we're in this class, and they're talking, and we got students, and they are completely uninterested uh, in what homeboy was saying, and so what both of them were saying. And so then they said, um, it's time for questions. And what was interesting is that it says time for questions and nobody said a word. Nobody had questions. So I then go, anybody got any questions? I'm going to ask some questions. So because my daddy watched all that news and I had to watch all that news because I read the newspaper and I had to read the newspaper, I began to hit my man with a bunch of political questions because at the time Ronald Reagan was president. And so I figured, got this white dude in front of me who was Republican, I might well ask him about some stuff about Ronald Reagan. I just started hitting him with questions. Now I know at some point he said, I don't know who the hell this little black boy in this class asking me all these questions, but I sure wish he would stop asking me these questions because I ain't trying to answer all the stuff he's saying. So what happened was my government teacher said, Roland, why don't you walk him to the next class? So he began to ask me questions, he began to talk, and 
he found out that I was in journalism and what I was involved in. And he said, man, this, this is a really smart guy. He said, you know what, you really need, he said, my daughter goes to TCU and they got a great journalism program. They could use a student like you. And I said, okay, all right, TCU was private. We ain't had no private school money. So I knew that wasn't gonna be happening. And I said, well, they're gonna have to give me a whole lot of money to come because we, uh -uh, we, we, we don't roll like that. And so, later that night, he ended up calling my house and telling my parents, man, y'all did a really good job raising y'all son. And my dad was like, thank you. Like, we know. Um, that's 86, y'all. Three years later, I'm at Texas A&M. And we're trying to decide whether we want to go to the Nat we need, we're going to the National Association of Black Journalists Convention in New York. Now we broke. I don't think y'all understand. We broke. Like, it's not like we had two hundred dollars and we needed eight hundred more. We had zero dollars and we needed a thousand. We, we just needed money. So I said, let's write letters to thirty foundations in Texas. No, 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 no. We got 29 no's. I'm sitting here like, damn, ain't no way we gonna get to this convention because we ain't got no money. Then all of a sudden, one day we got a letter in the mail. And I opened the mail up. And Roland, it is so, so good to hear that you are still interested in journalism. Glad to hear that. I have enclosed a check for a thousand dollars, and I hope this this will help uh, you and your fellow classmates attend this important convention. It was signed George Strake, president of the Strake Foundation. George Strake, president of the Strake Foundation, was the same white guy who spoke to my class in '86. No, no, see, y'all clapping on the wrong thing. You clap it on the thousand dollars, which I understand. The thousand dollars allowed for us to be able to go to the convention. At the conventions where I ran for national student representative and the board of directors. By running for that, I'm now on the board. Then I began to meet many of my other colleagues. Then that's where I met Neil Foote. Neil Foote then worked at the Washington Post. Neil Foote later was the one who hired me as the first editor of Time Journal's BlackAmericaWeb.com. On the same board was Jonathan Rogers. Jonathan Rogers then was the general manager at WBBM-TV in Chicago. Only spent a few months on the board because he got named president of the CBS owned and operated stations. Fast forward more than 15 years, Jonathan Rogers that retires at Discovery Network, gets hired as the founding CEO of TV One, and is the one who hires me at TV One. My first job was a result of me meeting Don Flores, who was president of the National Association of Hispanic Journalists, who was the one who told me to call Drew Marks, assistant managing editor at the Austin American Statesman. It was at the same convention where I first met Ken Bunting, who was the one who hired me at the Fort Worth Star Telegram 13 months after I joined the Austin American Statesman. I'm laying all this out because had we not gone to that convention, had we not been able to meet those folks, nearly every job that I've had in my career would not have been able to, uh, 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 I would not have been able to end up with those jobs because that's where I met the very people who made that possible. But what you should be clapping on is this here. It's not that George Strait sent the thousand dollars. It was because had I not watched the news with my daddy, had I not read the paper as a result of my mom and dad, I would not have been in a position to ask George Strait the questions. Had I not been able to ask him the questions, I would not have been able to impress him. Had I not impressed him, he would not have remembered this young black kid who three years ago was asking me all these questions in a high school class. And so had mama and daddy not impressed upon me to read and to study and to watch news and to pay attention, then I would not have been able to do that. 
What I'm saying is, when people today talk about me winning four NAACP Image Awards, when they talk about the, co uh, the coverage and covering this and doing this and doing that, that was all because of what two people who never went to college said, son, if you want to be successful, you must do this, this, and this. I can't be a living black history maker were it not for me paying attention to what they said when I was in high school and elementary school. So what I'm trying to say to you, if you listen to the right folks today, if you do what you need to do today, even if you think it's crazy and it makes no sense, you have no idea what is around the corner. You have no idea what's going to happen next year or the following year. You literally have no idea how your life could be changed, but you too could very well be a history maker that somebody talks about one day, but you got to do what you got to do today before that happens. And if you don't do it today, then you will never be in a position to meet somebody down the road who could change your life, that which could change your history, which could change your lineage, and which could literally change your bloodline. That's your challenge here in 2018. That's what God put on my spirit to speak to you tonight about. You have the ability to literally change the course, the future course of your entire family lineage if you're willing to be obedient today. Thank you very much.